I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Dr. Molly Castillo, a writer and videographer. She studied theater and psychoanalysis at New York University and has published in international journals on psychoanalysis and group dynamics. For her film, Vamix Room, she garnered the Gradiva Award, which recognizes artistic excellence in psychoanalysis and psychotherapy. She is also an analytic candidate at the National Psychological Association for Psychoanalysis in Greenwich Village, New York City. Her film, Vanix Room, is world premiering at the New Haven Documentary Film Festival this week. The film festival runs from August 18th to the 23rd and is online. Molly's film, Vamix Room, will be showing on August 22nd. Films are available for 48 hours after their scheduled viewing time, so join in. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. From Chapart Books, 2019. For more, please visit our publisher's website, chapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash v-a-n-e-s-s-a two three c-a-r-l your support is greatly appreciated for more information you can also visit my website dr vanessa sinclair dot net or the podcast main website rendering unconscious Org. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. Vamix Room is in the film festival this weekend. Yes, at the New Haven Documentary Film Festival on Saturday. Why don't you tell us a bit about it? Um, well, I'm excited about this, um, this screening. I've, I've worked on the film for many years now and I've shown it as a work in progress at different, in different venues. Um, but this is the final film. So this is the premiere of the film. Um, and I'm excited that it's gonna be in um, a venue with a lot of different kinds of films outside of the academic environment or the psychoanalytic environment. And the festival has been wonderfully supportive. Um, They've been really great people to work with. So um, it's the first time they've done a a virtual festival and they give you 24 to 48 hours to watch the film online. So yes, I'm I'm really excited about it reaching, you know, just sort of a general audience and looking forward to hearing what people think. That's great. So is it a documentary film festival? Yes, it's all documentaries from all over the world. Um, And it's supported by um, some of the institutions at Yale, um, some of the programs there and in the New Haven community and in Connecticut. Um, So yes, they're all documentaries, but it's a very wide range of subject matter. That's really great. And what made you decide to make this film about Vamik Volkan in the first place? Well, uh, it's it's interesting. I um, discovered his work probably 20 years ago, 15 or 20 years ago, um, through reading his book, Bloodlines. Um, and I was at one of the final conferences at the Center for the Study of Mind and Human Interaction, which he founded at... Um, the University of Virginia, the medical school there. And it was 
a unique um, program that he founded. Um, it was it was interdisciplinary. It was very interesting to me. It was interdisciplinary because there were psychoanalysts um, working with um, poets and historians and sociologists and politicians and civic leaders and going all over the world um, uh, to work in conflict resolution, bringing enemy groups together or representatives of enemy groups together to talk. And uh, I was really fascinated with the idea that groups carry historical memory and articulated it in these meetings. Um, and many of the ideas that came out of the work of that center. So that was part of the original inspiration. I think another aspect is I'm from the southern part of the United States. So I've, um, I've always been interested um, in applied psychoanalysis and thinking about groups and group history and how that informs the present. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Bambi Volkan's work is so amazing. And I had him on the podcast recently, as you know, and you sent me the film and it was amazing to watch. It's such a beautiful portrait of him and his work. And he was so much fun to talk to. I really enjoyed him. He's really charming. Um, and he's just been such a force in the field for so long. Yes. Yes, I agree. He, in the early part of his career, I mean, I, I, I think I'm, I've been really just fascinated with the, with the journey of his life as he's written it, you know, in his books. He's very prolific, as you know. But um, coming from Cyprus and um, the divisions there, and then studying um, in Ankara and immigrating to the States after um, studying to be a psychiatrist, he settled in um, the area where I'm from. Um, he worked in North Carolina. I don't know if he spoke about that uh, at Cherry Hospital mm. in North Carolina. I think he's written about it since too, and in his earlier work. But it was it was at a time where the hospitals were racially segregated, and he worked with um, a lot of of blacks at the time in in mental hospitals. And he writes about it um, in a very compelling way um, from this time period, from the point of view of that time period. Many of the doctors, as he describes them, were immigrants, white immigrants working with the black population in um, around Goldsboro, North Carolina. And then I think he went to Virginia, to the University of Virginia after that. So I sort of share this interest in that part of the country uh, where I'm from. Um, so that was also another motivating factor in, in becoming really interested in researching his work. Yeah, and this idea, like you mentioned, of transgenerational transmission of trauma, I feel like more than ever, I mean, it's always important, um, but I feel like right now it can really help in our understanding of like all of the issues um, that are being faced and coming to the surface, basically, collectively. Yes, yes, it's very interesting. I, I don't know if you're, the call of the controversy around Confederate monuments, right? And um, the removal of Robert E. Lee statues and what happened in Charlottesville, for instance, in 2017. Um, I think all of that speaks to the historical trauma of, of the South um, uh, and the inability of, of many people in the South still to come to terms with the fact that they lost the Civil War. Um, I think that's very much alive today and also in our politics, in, in the present day politics and how many people are feeling very um, uh, dynamically engaged with the present political um, race. And how did you come to psychoanalysis in the first place? Well, um, I've, as a, as a young adult, I got into psychoanalysis um, and it was sort of by fluke. I mean, I didn't know I was really getting into psychoanalysis. I knew that I had some things that I wanted to work on and my own difficult history. But um, I got into, um, I, I knew a social worker who, who, who referred me to an analyst who was just wonderful for many years. Um, so I've had the experience of the clinical um, 
work. And, and that's been so meaningful to me over the years. And so were you a filmmaker first? No, and I didn't, I never really um, set out to be a filmmaker. Um, I, I, I know that I'm a writer, but I was, I, I got interested in these ideas of applied psychoanalysis through reading Vulcan's work. And he did a, a lecture series at Austin Riggs on Thursday nights. And, um, you know, he was, he's such an open, lovely and generous man that he, he gave me um, some of the, the tapes from that lecture, which I couldn't attend. And I, and I looked over them. So the film really began with this Thursday night lecture series at Austin Riggs that he, that he conducted. Not those original um, CDs, they were CDs, uh, uh, ended up in the film but it was part of my learning about his work. Yes, yeah, so you mentioned your interest in psychoanalysis and filmmaking and the arts and bringing them together. So are these just like different interests that you had that you didn't necessarily mean to like go into anyone as like a field and now they've kind of converged and they're all kind of coming to fruition in this interesting way. Yes, yes. I, I didn't intend, I, don't, I still don't know exactly, I, well, I have the film. Um, and I, I am, like you, very interested in bringing in um, artistic expression into um, my psychoanalytic experience and seeing how they converge in different ways through writing and imagery. So yeah, that's very exciting for me, thinking about that. And, and really, it's the applied psychoanalysis that's, that's a, the most exciting to me, the applied psychoanalysis. and how to express it through artistic or aesthetic means. What do you tend to like to write about? Um, well, in, you know, in the recent years, I've been writing a lot about groups and group psychology. Um, I'm also, I'm interested in the, you know, um, the clinical theories as well uh, in the individual treatment. Um, but I, when I studied, when I was in graduate school, I was interested in theater a lot. So I, I wrote a lot about theater then and different um, aesthetic theories, um, studying Aristotle and Brecht and Artaud and different ways of thinking about art. That's really very exciting to me. So I'm still trying to piece how all these things go together, but um, ideas of theater are, are fascinating too. I think that's that's how I put the two together because Vamek, his writing is very dramatic when he writes about Serbia, right? This climactic, which is really the, the climactic piece of my film, is is um, his reading of the events um, at Kosovo in 1989 and how Milosevic uh, reactivated this historical memory. I mean, that's that's theater. Uh, you know, it, it's regressive theater, but it's it's a form of theater, and um, I'm interested in, I'm very interested in, in those dramatic renderings. Yeah, it was amazing to see that in the film. Yeah, um, I, um, you know, Serbian TV was very um, cooperative and, and helpful in um, helping me get some of the archival footage for that for that time and that day, the rally that was staged um, at Kosovo, that was a reenactment of this historical, this historical battle. So um, yeah, that's, that's probably the most compelling, one of the most compelling parts of the film. Yeah, it was very interesting to research and to go back and look at that footage and then recreate it. And what brought you your interest to theater? Um, I mean, originally, I think I was, I was, I was an analysand that had a lot of emotion on the surface. Um, and it was almost like I, you know, it was hard to know what to do with it. Um, and we do so many di different things with our strong emotions, you know, but mine was just right on the surface. And the theater was a, a, a really productive and generative place for me to put those emotions through characters into a kind of narrative. 
Um, I think as I, as I worked more in analysis and was able to put more of it into that narrative, I didn't need the theater as much as an outlet or a, a holding space for all that kind of um, very difficult feeling. But the theater, going back to the Greeks, is, there's so many wonderful stories where you can, where you can use that kind of um, affect and strong emotion. Absolutely. And can we talk about our toe? I love our toe. Sure. <laughs> do. Let's do. What brought your interest in our toe? Um, how was that? Well, he, you know, he's such an influential, influential modern artist. Um, and you know, his ideas, um, you know, his theater was the theater of cruelty. And, you know, his form of, of aesthetic was a kind of desublimation, right? It was using uh, the functions of the body on stage. And um, his approach to theater and aesthetics was so uh, original. Um, and the way he used aggression um, these were all ideas that attracted me to his work and just the pure energy um, of his theater. You know, it's all based in the body. Um, and I think also he's an incredible writer. The way he writes about the body without organs. And um, so he was just, uh, he's a powerful thinker and writer. And um, I think he's contributed so much to postmodern thinking about art. Um, I think also of his drawings. I, I don't know if you know of his drawings where he is, you know, often attacking the paper, right, with, with, with holes um, that he creates with his pencil in the paper, or there's just so much dynamic and destructive energy. But this idea of, of destroying and recreating yourself again and again, I think is also very useful. Um, that the idea that we're always recreating ourselves in certain ways. Um, so yeah, he's he's also quite interesting as a um, theoretician of aesthetics. Yeah, I but love him. I love reading his letters. I love reading letters in general. I love yeah. reading people's letters. Yes, yes, yes. His letters. Um, uh, to Riviere, I think that correspondence was fascinating. Um, and the way he spoke about absence and um, this kind of existential um, fear and panic that he was often confronting about nothingness or about not being whole or not being um, uh, complete um, is also, I think, very, very interesting. Yeah. he could. He saw pretty clearly, I think. And I love also how no matter what happened to him or how he was institutionalized, he was always adamant about his perspectives and like didn't buy into like that he was just crazy. Yeah, he was incredibly resilient. I mean, you know, I don't know, I, 50 or 60 electroshock, electroshock treatments that he received at Rodez, right? And he continued to write and to produce and he was very prolific. Um, despite being so misunderstood in his in his psyche by by um, medical science, um, he continued to produce and to think and to be creative, despite you know the way he was treated by medicine. Yeah, and I feel like that's really the true function of art. Like that's a real artist, you know, is that he was using everything and using his body and all of his emotions and really like processing it through your work. And even the way you described um, you coming to theater and like processing all these emotions through the theatrical work. That's like, that to me is like the real purpose of art and how humans create, like why we started creating art maybe in the first place so many thousands yeah. of years ago. Yes. As opposed to like a lot of our, when I moved to New York, I was so excited to live in New York and like get to go see a lot of art because Miami, Miami's 
has a lot more now, but it mm-hmm. was kind of pretty destitute on that contemporary art front <laughs> when I was growing up. Uh, and my mother's an artist, so we would always go to museums when we would travel, but not so much at home. So I was really excited to to move to New York. Mm-hmm. And I was really disappointed in a lot of the contemporary art scene because it all seems so much like a, a lot of like kind of thought projects of like people or people trying too much that it's it was too much like well thought out what they were trying to say and what they wanted to impart to the audience or the viewer rather than just like doing making the work I kind of like art like Francis Bacon or Jean-Michel Basquiat where people are just like making the work and then you know you can see what it says after you've made it or like see how it speaks to you um, rather than trying to like let your ego decide so much what you're going to say like let your unconscious speak more. yes and I feel like that's missing a lot in the contemporary art scene unfortunately yeah 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 I and I agree someone like Artaud he, his his artistic work was very primary process oriented. It was so directly connected to the body, what he felt, the body's perceptions, the body's functions. And there wasn't that secondary piece. It wasn't as much emphasized going over and editing it and and the secondary process. It was more immediate to the body. Um, And I, I, frankly, I think a lot of performance artists for that kind of, for that kind of taste in art, performance artists, work a lot um, in that in that same vein. I mean, he Arto so influenced performance theory and performance work. Um, are you, you probably know what I'm talking about? But work that's that's uses the body as the primary aesthetic um, object. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like I have a friend who just recently passed, um, who was a performance artist named Genesis Peorage. And uh, when she was younger, I, when you were talking earlier about Arto and bringing it to the body, I just realized like Jen must have been so um, influenced by Arto because a lot of his earlier work from like the 1960s and 70s was very like body oriented, like body functions and like secretions and ingesting and expelling and cutting the body but it was like really really body oriented like kind of pushing the body to its most like extreme in a lot of ways and actually told me once that um that's why he stopped doing performance art for a while publicly because he felt like he was pushing his body to such an extreme at some point that he felt like he shouldn't be subjecting other people to that experience anymore because he would like go unconscious and things like that um and then eventually he's like i just need to work out whatever this is that i'm doing like in private and then i'll go back in public for a while he actually took a break for a while yeah Yeah, that's interesting i you know when i did my graduate work it was at at NYU in performance studies. And we often talked, you know, in, in art, there's, there's the artist, there's the spectator, and there's the art object, this kind of triangular configuration. But in performance art, performance artists are using their body. So they're the artist and they're the art object. And the spectator is this is the next, the other party. So it's, it's a completely different kind of take on art. I, I never did performance art myself, but I studied it and always appreciated it and, and know what you mean. There's something about that direct use of the body and its expressions, like in the work of Maria Abramovic, um, that's, that's so powerful and can, be, um, can just turn your thoughts on their head um, by looking at something in a completely different way. Yeah, that was one of the amazing shows that was on when I was in New York was her show at the MoMA um, and getting to see like getting to walk through the two naked people so close and like getting to see kind of they had, I guess, young performance artists kind of acting out performances she had done throughout her lifetime. Um, And it was really, it was really amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, another, I mean, you, you probably realize, but another influential thinker for performance art and, you know, a lot of avant-garde art was Brecht. This idea that the, the spectator is involved somehow in the performance or they're not under the illusion of realism, right, as, as, as the theater was used before he came along. Um, you want the, audi- the lights up in the, in the house to be on, right? You know, 
you want the, the people, the spectators to know they're watching a show and to be able to think critically about what's happening and about capitalism or different social constructions that we often take as, as given or natural. So yes, these are thinkers that influenced my work and um, even the piecing together of the film to some degree. That's great. And I think even in psychoanalysis, there's a return to more focus on the body because I feel like we got like really intellectualized <laughs> at a period. And like, um, I think people are going back to like listening more to the body and the body symptoms um, rather than just like kind of over intellectualizing or rationalizing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The body speaks. Yes. Yeah. I don't know if I mentioned, I do have some interviews with, with Otto Kernberg that I would like to piece together. Um, so yes, that'll take me a while, but that's probably one of my next projects. What's that been like? Well, I haven't really, I just have, they're just recorded at this point. I haven't done any editing, but um, in their very simple interviews, just him talking about his ideas, but that is something I'd like to put together. That's great. Me, me and a few other analysts um, started this group, Das Umbehagen, I don't know, maybe eight years ago. And he was actually the first speaker to come and speak with us because we were really frustrated with kind of the institutionalization of psychoanalysis. And we just felt like our creativity wasn't able to bloom. Like it was very much like kind of just like every other school <laughs> was turned into like going through the steps of what you need to do to get the degree, but without really like fostering a lot of like thought or creativity. Mm -hmm. And we were just feeling frustrated and asked him to come and talk to this like group of, I don't know, 30 of us or something. And, yeah. uh, and he did, and he talked about, um, he wrote two papers on the like ways to kill the creativity of a psychoanalytic candidate. <laughs> and oh, really? uh -huh. yeah, they're great. There's ones from like the late eighties and ones from the nineties, right before he published it right before he was about to become president of the IPA. Um, and he just wrote these like really tongue in cheek kind of pieces about like, you know, don't make sure that the students just like memorize Freud said, and don't actually start thinking the way Freud thought because then they'll become radical and revolutionary and not just like do what they're told basically <laughs> things like that yeah he was really he was really great yeah I'll look for those papers I don't know if they're on pep web but I'd like to read them yeah they're there mm -hmm. yeah 30 ways to 30 ways to kill the I don't think he said kill but 30 ways to crush this the creativity of the psychoanalytic candidates <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great I, I look forward to reading it what got you interested in Kernberg um his ideas about aggression and envy I think and um the pre-edipal ideas about that kind of ferocious aggress aggressiveness and envy um and I, I'm interested in thinking about that in relation to groups too um I mean, there's others who've written about it, but yes, that's what's interesting to me. Um, one of the things interesting to me about his work. And so, so he's in New York and you're in New York, so you've been able to sit with him to get to interview him yeah. a few times? Yes, he's in White Plains. Uh, I think he has an office here too, but I saw him in White Plains, yes. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Well, I look forward to that too. <laughs> Well, thank you. I, I've enjoyed talking to you. Yeah, it's been really fun. And so the film festival, it starts on the 18th. So this will be released on the 18th. Yeah, so it starts today. <laughs> and it uh -huh. goes through the weekend. And your film is being shown on the 22nd. On the 22nd, right. Starting at 11 a.m. for 48 hours, I believe. And tickets start at $5.00. There's a scale, but I think the minimum is $5. That's wonderful. I think it's really wonderful. And I think a lot of places are going to kind of integrate this concept even after these kinds of immediate crises have passed. Um, and that 
like people like like you said they've never done this kind of online festival before it's always been in a certain location and now it's available any anywhere worldwide you know it's amazing and i feel like a lot of people i talk to are going to try to kind of keep that aspect in a way either of their practice seeing patients remotely or being able like the freud museum i've been obsessed with taking talk listening to talks at the freud museum in london because they always have such great talks but of course i'm not in london so I, i've never been um, but now they're doing things online to kind of keep revenue flowing while the museum's been closed mm -hmm. and hopefully places like that keep doing that so that the international audience can keep enjoying these things uh, even yeah. after yeah. they've reopened. Yeah, it's, a, it's one good thing that may come out of all this this crisis, I agree, is more remote possibilities. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Dr. Molly Castillo. Her film, Van Makes Room, is screening at the New Haven Documentary Film Festival this weekend on August 22nd. Look at the text accompanying this episode for links to everything. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. From Chapart Books, 2019. For more, please visit our publisher's website, chapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash v-a-n-e-s-s-a two three c-a-r-l your support is greatly appreciated for more information you can also visit my website dr vanessa sinclair dot net or the podcast main website rendering unconscious Org. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. Blood or Hunter's Moon, the emphasis breaking, probably changed my everything, has its reproduction and reduction, he and we, universe of creation, but there is a connection and a sympathy, those both we Spirit is best sought, only when no other was at the front. The contrary, he disturbed in his soul. Hurricane of force is what attracts. Here I wish to make more use of the positive power knowledge relations. But seriously, everything good? I am an occupant. 
I am special. Object, objective, or path. In a spurn, essay, how are you? By another day in the experience. I heard there were 12 gods of fellow artists. That's how the story was told to, which produce at its most is lived by. Those things will won a bunch of awards is creation, the analysis to it and to the gems. And no matter what is happening in my, there is here a stirring of the value and organ of the child is more real. Experience is consume and give light of the possessed has been burned, tried to kill me then, I'm okay with that, as signified by the intense experience, mysterious and her influences, and have as many more information in this matter, propagating the remain queen in posterior supremacy, it, in composing verbal, of right ingredient they to respond to provided not only the such we not fully evening of leisure but should her interest compel and detached awareness or listening I find that you're not the train and I thought of you and I time will tell movement act Firework going off in front of me. Benefit. Attack. Being. Summary. A message for as the mountains. El Ea emerged to be me. And words that make up the fictional self. The unauthorized.